Do you realize this whole book points to Jesus? Jesus is in the book. He's in the whole book. I, I could take you through here. And, and in the beginning, you look at Adam and Eve and they fell. And God took animals and he slew them. He sacrificed them and made them coats of skin, shedding the blood, covering their sins. Picture of Jesus. You, you go to the next chapter, Abel and Cain. Abel was a keeper of sheep and he made an offering to the Lord that the Lord received. He offered him a, a lamb, a picture of the lamb of God, which was Jesus. You go into Genesis chapter 22, Abraham and Isaac. You see Isaac placing the wood for a sacrifice on his back, going up a hill. Just the way Jesus did many years later, placed the wood on his back for a sacrifice and he went up the hill. As a matter of fact, I can show you a scripture is the same hill. He's in the book. The life lesson here, the Bible points us and everyone else to Jesus. Welcome to Cross the Bridge with David McGee. David is a senior pastor of The Bridge in Kernersville, North Carolina. When we look at the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or the New, it points us to one person, and that person is Jesus. Today, Pastor David explains how this works as he continues in the book of Acts, chapter 8. Here's David McGee with his teaching, Arise and Go. Turn with me to Acts, chapter 8. Well, we're talking about the early church, and, and part of that is really, you know, what is it that we're supposed to be doing? So that's what we're doing. We don't see it as the perfect church, but we see it as a model, as a representative of what we're supposed to be doing. And a lot of times, sadly, we look at the early church and go, well, it must have been nice to be in the early church. You can be active and watching God work in your life, through your life, just the way the people in the book of Acts did. The Bible tells us that God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this same God that's working in this book of Acts is active in this fellowship as well. Now, we're going to really start to teach him with verse 30, but for context's sake, let's pick it up with verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south, along the road which, is down, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Verse 27, so he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah, the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Verse 30, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what? you are reading. So again, context sake, Philip is in Samaria. There's this awesome, awesome meetings taking place, people getting saved, awesome time going on. And God says to Philip, won't you go out to the desert? This is important to understand this context because when Philip's in the desert and God says, go speak to this person, I want you to notice, let's look back at verse 30. So Philip moped on over there, complaining the whole way that he was in the rotten, stinking desert. <laughs> Is that what it says to him? No, that's not what it says. It says he ran to him. <clears throat> I like that. Why? Because he was filled with enthusiasm. Filled with enthusiasm. He was an encourager. Filled with courage. That E-N is from the Greek. It is like our word I-N. And in Courage is being filled with courage. Enthusiastic is from being filled with God. In Theo. In Theo. Now, do you think of most believers as being enthusiastic? Well, if you go to church here, you do. <laughs> because, you know, we want to be enthusiastic about serving God. We want to be enthusiastic about walking with the Lord. Let me share with you who one of my heroes is. Tigger. I love Tigger. If you're a visitor, you're going, oh no, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> we're all going to sing the Tigger now, and uh, we're going to sing the Tigger song, and it's going to be up on the screen, and no, I'm kidding. I'm joking. But why is Tigger a hero to me? Because he's so enthusiastic. And see, the thing is, I think far too many Christians are more like Eeyore. 
Kind of convicting, isn't it? And if you're like Eeyore, you know what? Don't expect to be contagious. When you invite people to church, are you like Tigger, being very enthusiastic, or are you like Eeyore? Well, music's too loud and he talks too long. You want to go? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. I mean, if you're saying that, don't expect it to be contagious. But if you're filled with enthusiasm, that is contagious. And see, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. It's so cool. So many of you share the stories of, you know what? You, you, you know, I was talking with a couple yesterday and, and they've been here for a few weeks. And I said, well, you know, where, where did you go before here? And they said, we, we, we didn't go anywhere. We saw all the people and we got curious. We came in and we, it's just very different. And now we're here. And so many of you have shared stories about how you're excited once again to be coming to church. Man, that's such a blessing. And that's the way that it's supposed to be. As we gather together and we worship together, and there's nothing in the world like that. And as we look into God's word and, and God speaks to us, it's just an awesome, awesome thing. So we should be filled with Theo, filled with God, filled with enthusiasm and encouragement. So Philip says to the eunuch, do you understand what you're reading in verse 31? And the eunuch said, and he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Isn't it neat how God works? God told Philip to leave the desert. I mean, told him to leave Samaria, to go to the desert. He had already arranged the whole thing. He'd already set the whole thing up. And he goes in the desert. And imagine Philip's joy when he looks over and he sees this guy reading out loud the book of Isaiah. He's like, oh, praise God. This is why I'm here. Do you understand that's the way God works? That God will go before you? The life lesson here, God goes before you when you are following him. God goes before you when you are following him. If you've ever thought that you're supposed to kick the door down for God, I'm sorry, you're wrong. You're supposed to look for open doors. And too many times we act like, you know, God's mercenaries or something. We're going to kick the door down and we're going to, whether these people want to hear about Jesus or not, we're going to tell them. I don't think that's the Lord. I think God opens doors. And, and you know what? If you ask God to open doors for you, he will open doors. And when he does open doors, walk through them. And it's just that easy. Here's the thing too. And I love this. How can I, unless someone guides me? The thing that we do here, teaching verse by verse, you don't find that a lot. Now, it's sad you used to, but that's what we do. Meaning we teach verse by verse, wherever I stop today, we pick it up next week. And this is, I think, by far the best way to learn the Bible. Now, some of you may have been in churches where the, you know, you'd come in and, and they did all sorts of hoopla. They you know, took four offerings and did this and da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And it got to the teaching and, and you know, it was like 10 minutes long. And there was one verse. And you wonder why you don't have a deeper knowledge of your Bible. You weren't taught the Bible. The sad fact is many of you weren't even encouraged to read it and to study it. Well, here, we do encourage you to read it. We do encourage you to study it. And, you know, and if, at no other time during the week you're, that you're in the Bible, I'm going to read it to you on Sunday morning. I'm going to read it to you on Thursday night. Now, I encourage you to be in it outside of that. But know that my heart is to be your guide, if you will, through scriptures. You're listening to Pastor David McGee on Cross the Bridge. He'll be right back with more in just a moment. But I want to remind you of the free resources available to you on crossthebridge.com. There's a team of hundreds of people that will pray for somebody to be saved. You have a loved one that needs to know Jesus as Savior. You need people to pray for them. You need someone to present God's Word to them. Every day we're presenting God's Word to them here on Cross the Bridge with Pastor David McGee. We can pray for them as well just by simply going to crossthebridge.com and click on the Pray for the Lost button. All you need to do is put in the first names of the people you love that need to know Jesus as Savior. Click on Submit and immediately hundreds of people will begin praying for your lost loved ones. And what an awesome way to bring your loved ones to Jesus. Here's a word from Associate Pastor D.A. Brown. We want to take just a minute to pray for some cities in our listening audience, specifically Merlin, Pendleton, Portland, Powell Butte, Prairie City, and Redmond, Oregon. 
Lord, we thank you for the people living in these cities. Lord, we pray that you would draw them into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for their homes, that there would be unity and love, that they would follow you with all their heart, soul, and strength as a family. Lord, we pray for the pastors and churches in these areas. God, that you would anoint them to teach your word, verse by verse even. Lord, that you would give the pastors wisdom and discernment on how to serve and love the people that God brings. Lord, we love you. We thank you for these cities. And we pray that you do a mighty work in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. And now, let's get back to David McGee as he continues teaching verse by verse. Verse 32. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? So again, this passage is in Isaiah. It's what's referred to as the suffering servant passage. And, and understand, it is, he's quoting from the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Our Bible is based upon the original Hebrew. Most of our Bibles are t- based on the Textus Receptus is the complicated name. But he's sharing this passage. And this passage is pointing to Jesus. Do you realize this whole book points to Jesus? You know, we talk on Thursday night, we're going through the Hebrew scriptures, what people refer to as the Old Testament. We go through there and many Thursday nights, people get saved. They're born again. They ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins. Now that probably, that probably freaks some of you out because you're like Old Testament. How can somebody get saved off the Old Testament? Jesus is in the book. He's in the whole book. I could take you through here. And and in the beginning, you look at Adam and Eve and they fell. And God took animals and he slew them. He sacrificed them and made them coats of skin, shedding the blood, covering their sins. Picture of Jesus. You go to the next chapter, Abel and Cain. Abel was a keeper of sheep and he made an offering to the Lord that the Lord received. He offered him a, a lamb, a picture of the lamb of God, which was Jesus. You go into Genesis chapter 22, Abraham and Isaac. You see Isaac placing the wood for a sacrifice on his back, going up a hill. Just the way Jesus did many years later. Placed the wood on his back for a sacrifice and he went up the hill. As a matter of fact, I can show you a scripture is the same hill. He's in the book. The life lesson here. The Bible points us and everyone else to Jesus. The Bible points us and everyone else to Jesus. And, and I can, you can just go on. I mean, from Genesis to Revelation, you look at the feast. You look at the feast of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Oh, it just speaks of Jesus. You look at the Passover, speaks of Jesus. He's throughout this book. And this book is all about God created us. God loves us. We turned our back on him and fell away. And God won't rest until he wins us back. That's the whole thing summed up. The whole book points to Jesus. So the suffering servant passage. You realize that's what Jesus did? I mean, we think of him as a teacher. We think of him as a healer. We think of him as savior. We think of him as Lord. We think of him as resurrected one. We think of him as creator. He's all those things. And and that's good. We think of him those ways. But he was also a servant. A servant who got down on his knees to wash the feet of the disciples. Pastor, why are you mentioning that? Well, because the book of Acts refers to him several times as a servant. I'll give you just four other places. Acts 3.13 says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Acts 3.26 it says, to you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Acts 4, 27. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Acts 4, 30. 
Acts chapter 4, verse 3. By stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. What's my point? Well, have you been here for very long? It's one you've heard before. I want to be like Jesus. I don't necessarily mean I want to look like him. I, 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 I want to be like him from the inside out. I want to follow him. As I look in this book and I see things about him, I, I want my life to begin to imitate him. See, if I sat up here this morning and I said, you know what, I am just like Michael Jordan. You'd sit there and go, no, you ain't. You'd never say, well, Pastor, how tall are you? I'm 5'10". Okay, well, you know, I'm thinking Michael Jordan's a little taller than that. You play professional basketball? No, nope, never played professional basketball. Never played college ball. But I'm just like Michael Jordan. You'd say, no, 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 you're not. Right. And if you sit here this morning and you tell me that you're a follower of Jesus, but you're not serving, who or what are you following? If Jesus was a servant himself, and look, if anybody ever walked this earth who deserved to be worshipped and praised and shouldn't have had to serve, it was him. But you know what he did? He gave us a model. Even in the fact that he was baptized by somebody who their very salvation was dependent upon him. That's how much humility he had. And yet we look at that and we go, eh, you know, I don't know. I don't want to, eh, Christianity is kind of spectator sport. No, it's not. We're supposed to be serving. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Life lesson here. Every person who is following Jesus should be serving others in a caring and committed way. And it is my job to encourage you in the service strongly. Let me run through just a few verses. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 says, think of ways to encourage one another to outburst of love and good deeds. That's part of what I do when I teach. I want to encourage you to outburst of love and good deeds. Titus 2 7 says, in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine showing integrity, reverence, and incorruptibility. A pattern of good works. Titus 2, 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works, looking for something to do. Not, oh, amen, I've got to do something. No, zealous, looking for a way to express your gratitude and your thankfulness to Jesus to others. The Bible says that God gave us the fivefold ministry in the book of Ephesians. Why? That the equipping of the saints to do the work of ministry. Now, there's a couple of really cool things in there. Uh, Ephesians 4, 12, 4, 13, 4, 13. A couple of cool things. Number one, you guys are called saints. Yeah. <laughs> How cool is that? I mean, you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. He does it. And even though you may stumble and even though you may still fall occasionally, God looks down and says, you're a saint. I've been called a lot of things in my life. <laughs> I had not many people called me a saint, but he did. And it says, for the work of the ministry. Oh, now this is, this is, I'm going to go from preaching to meddling now. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. You may have been brought up thinking, well, what happens is I go to a church and there's a staff that works there that serves me. And that's it. That's unscriptural. What the Bible says is I'm supposed to teach you guys to equip you to do the work of the ministry. So next time, remember that. You know, if you get upset that, I, you know, maybe a friend of yours or maybe a family member, you know, somebody, they were sick and nobody prayed for them. Did you pray for them? See, I'm supposed to be equipping you guys to do the work of the ministry. And, and when this happens, it's a beautiful thing. Titus 3.8, this is a true saying. I want you to give special emphasis to these matters so that those who believe in God may be concerned with giving their time to doing good deeds, which are good and useful for everyone. The scriptures talk about this, guys. They say, this is what we're supposed to be doing. This isn't me just getting on a tirade. It's, this, is, you know, it, this is the suffering servant of Jesus. This is the servant that he's listed in the book of Acts. And if we're following him, we're to be serving well, I serve at work. Well, that's great you serve at work. But I think scripturally the concept is that we serve in the local body and we serve one another so that we can reach as many people as we can. And 
Titus 3.14 says, And let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. See, when you do good things, when you do good works, you are being fruitful. Now, and I've talked about works and good deeds, so, but, but let me be clear. Is that the way you gain entrance into heaven? Absolutely not. You can't do it. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough to earn your entrance into heaven. You're given entrance by grace. When you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, he doesn't look at you and go, well, I don't know, you're worthy to be forgiven. No, he doesn't do that. He looks at you and said, you know what? Anybody that comes in to me, I will in no wise cast out. If you're asking me, I'll forgive you. And God begins to change us from the inside out. And then because we're grateful, that should lead us to good works. But we're saved by grace. But it's interesting in the passage that and some of you are probably familiar with, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the passage that speaks about us being saved by grace leads us right into the fact that we're supposed to be doing things for the Lord. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's grace, salvation, Verse 10, for we are his workmanships, workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Once we're saved, we're supposed to be doing good works. We're supposed to be serving one another, active in the local body. And here's the thing, too. Understand this. Your entrance into heaven is by grace. Are we clear? It's by grace alone. Okay, when you get up there, they're not going to say, well, did you serve in Sparkle or something? You're, you get in. But what happens then? When you get in, what will you hear? Well done, good and faithful spectator. That's not what it says. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Do you know who that's going to be said to? People who are serving. And if you get up there and you go, well, yeah, you know, I, I was getting ready to start serving. And, you know, and now that I'm dead, I'm ready to live for you, Lord. And I don't want you going up to heaven and going, hey, hey I'm here. Well, were you serving me? Uh uh What do you mean serving you? What were you serving me? Were you serving the children's ministry, doing something like that? Huh, I never heard I was supposed to do something like that. He's going to say, where'd you go to church? Who's your pastor? He didn't tell you about this? And then if I didn't tell you, he'd be looking for me and I'm in trouble. I'm not going to be in trouble. If you won't be in trouble, you'd be in trouble. But I'm going to tell you the way it is. I'm going to tell you what this book says about serving him. The thing about rewards, like don't sit there and go, well, I don't know. I've never heard that before. And some of you may be thinking that. At Matthew 16 is the words of Jesus. He says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with, with his angels. Then he will reward each according to his works. And James has even stronger language. 2.26 says, Just as the body is dead without a spirit, so also faith is dead without good deeds. James 2.17. So you see, it isn't enough just to have faith. Faith that doesn't show itself by good deeds is no faith at all. It is dead and useless. So my question is, do you have a dead faith or do you have a living faith? If you have a living faith, you can think back on this week and think, you know, I came into church and cleaned and that was cool and I had painted and I did this and I was doing children's ministry and I shared my faith and called somebody, encouraged them and emailed somebody. You can point to things. That's a living, vibrant faith. That's what the world's looking for. Far too long, the world has looked at the church and seen a dead, inactive faith and said, I don't get it. What do you want to show them? I want to show them a real faith, a, a, faith that, a faith that works. Not that though they may have asked Jesus to forgive them of their sins, they're still not giving their lives away. Occasionally I'll hear somebody say, well, I, I, I would serve, but I just don't have the time. No, sorry. It's not a priority for you because we're all given seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So what you're saying is that the people, your time is more important than the people that do serve here. And if you're still trying to figure out how God can fit into your schedule, he's given you your life. He woke you up this morning. He gave you the breath that you took when you opened your eyes this morning. He's the very God that's controlling your heartbeat right now. And you're telling me you can't find time to serve him. Friend, do you know for sure that your sins have been forgiven? You can know right now. I want to lead you in a short, simple prayer, simply telling God you're sorry and asking him to help you to live for him. Please pray this prayer with me out loud right now. Dear Jesus, I believe you died for me. 
that I could be forgiven. And I believe you were raised from the dead that I could have a new life. And I've done wrong things. I have sinned. And I'm sorry. Please forgive me of all those things. Please give me the power to live for you all of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, according to the Bible, you've been forgiven, you've been born again. So congratulations, friend. You just made the greatest decision that you will ever make. God bless you. If you prayed that prayer with David for the first time, we'd love to hear from you. Visit CrossTheBridge.com and click on God's Plan for New Life to receive our First Steps package with helpful resources to help you begin your walk with Christ. God wants to bless you and encourage your relationships today. Whether you are married, considering marriage, or engaged to be married, we have a resource for you. Pastor David wants to send you his four-part video series, Allies Stay Friends. Allow God to minister to your marriage through His Word today. This was an unforgettable weekend that encouraged many marriages, and you and your spouse can be encouraged too. Allies Stay Friends is our thanks for your generous gift today to help more people hear God's truth on this station and beyond so they can cross the bridge from death to life. Please visit CrossTheBridge.com today to give a gift of any amount and get your copy of Allies Stay Friends. Well, D.A., before we go, what are some ways that we can bless our listeners? Each day you can wake up with encouragement from Pastor David through the Word of God with his email devotional, life lessons to consider, a daily reading plan, and a thought to meditate on throughout your day from the heart of David McGee. Those are terrific, and it's easy and it's free. So folks, sign up today at CrossTheBridge.com. Thanks again for listening, and join us next time as David McGee continues teaching verse by verse through the book of Acts.